this uh, we're having a workshop today. We appreciate all you all coming. The first item is to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> this is the third workshop in a series of four workshops with regard to sand mines and issues regarding sand mines. Currently, there is a 12-month county moratorium processing mining permit and, uh, and or site plan applications. That moratorium will expire January 7, 2009. During the moratorium period, the county is reviewing its mining regulations. That's why we're here. The central component of that review is a series of Planning and Zoning Commission workshops devoted to the specific local mining issues. We've been through two already. The first was groundwater and surface water discharge impacts. We went through the last one was traffic and nuisance. Today is going to be compatibility and notice. We have one more to go. For those of you all who don't know, it's scheduled for August 13th, 2008, and that's going to be compliance and enforcement. The hope today is we're going to pull together what we've done to some extent in the first two workshops, trying to fit the uh, groundwater, our environmental concerns, and or traffic concerns into a, the, how, it, how it works with compatibility of the property, surrounding property, and then deal with notice issues. Um, and then the fourth would be maybe how we deal regulations and how we make compliance more applicable or, or workable. So with that in mind, Mr. Bowling, I know that you are ready to go start us off. Thank you, Chairman Hamner. For the record, I'm Stan Bowling, County Planning Director, and I'll be making a presentation that will take a while, and then uh, Public Works is scheduled after that. Should we settle in then? Well, maybe. <laughs> um, Again, as, as you had mentioned, Mr. Chairman, this is the third of four workshops on, and this particular workshop we're focusing on compatibility and notice. Uh, just for the record and anyone who's, who may be watching later on, uh, there's a lot of information on the county website under mining regulations. <coughs> it's kind of the center of the home page. All the presentations for all the workshops and the staff reports and so forth are on there, so it's easily accessible from the web. Um, a couple of things as we start looking at uh, compatibility uh, and notice requirements. One of the first things that uh, we want to, to uh, just kind of reiterate, actually, is what are the characteristics of, of the mining operations that we're talking about? And there are efforts going on in other counties right now that staff and probably others are keeping track of. Uh, but one thing that I wanted to remind everyone of was some of the differences between what we call major mining counties and the type of mining that we have in Indian River because there are some different scales and different impacts. Uh, there's some things to learn from these jurisdictions, but there are other things that, that don't, don't truly apply. There are several counties listed here that have major uh, mining activities. Uh, you've seen this from the Strategic, uh, the strategic uh, Resource Committee from the state, and uh, Chuck Kramer had used this graphic. Uh, and some notes on it to show some of the major areas in, uh, in Florida of deposits of limestone and sand resource. And these major mining counties have large deposits. Uh, it's either hard aggregate, lime rock, uh, or phosphate. These mines cover several thousands of acres, large exposed areas, mining life of 70 to 100 years, and scale and certain impacts are different, uh, especially if you get into phosphate mining. There's a lot of, uh, lot of differences there. For Indian River County mining, when we're looking at compatibility and trying to kind of gauge the parameters of mining in Indian River County, it's primarily sand and fill. Uh, local development is dependent upon the local supply. We do have scattered deposits of coquina, still a bit of an unknown. Uh, we've had pockets have showed up in some of the mines that we've had over the years uh, locally, but, but pretty small. There seems to be uh, a, a bit of a concentration uh, of the coquina that is in the county along the I-95 corridor. We'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, mostly local use, so we don't have uh, much exporting of locally mined materials. Smaller in scale in the major counties, we don't have blasting or active chemical agents involved. That has a whole other set of impacts in, in some of the other counties. And we don't have some of the contamination and cleanup issues, especially you have with respect to phosphate mining. In uh, Indian River County, the size of the sites vary, 40 to 300 acres. 
Uh, we have active phases limited to 20 acres. We have setbacks, uh, and what we've tended to see on projects is 100, anywhere from 150 feet, which is the minimum, to 400 feet from property lines of all the on-site activities. Uh, again, the material mined is sand, fill, and coquina, and the mine life maximum, and in none of the regulations from other jurisdictions that we have reviewed, and there have been three dozen, uh, we've not seen a mining life limitation that we have in this county, and that's 10 years maximum. Access is controlled off of collector arterial roads. Uh, you all revisited the days and hours of operations, and you're familiar with those. Uh, the end condition, at the end of the mining life, the reclaimed state, uh, and we have new regulations that are now in effect uh, with our landscape code changes, that any of the <coughs> ponds that will be uh, created will be non-rectilinear uh, ponds, and they'll have uh, literal zone plantings. So that's a requirement that would apply to to any, any newer operations going forward. We also have multiple sites, though, and, and cumulative impact because a lot of the material, just sand and fill, it, it's, it can be made available in a lot of different locations. So there are possibilities for multiple sites and, and cumulative impacts of mines. The locations that we've had in the past, just wanted to, to kind of reiterate, and if you look at the mines where they have been over time, uh, they have been close to the urban service area, inside the urban service area. That's the black line here that includes the unincorporated area of the county and the municipalities. And in the past, we've had mines that are, again, kind of on the edge of development, uh, pretty close to uh, development at the time that the mining operations occurred in different areas of the county. And kind of the, the more recent wave has been outside the urban service area in agriculturally designated areas, I'd say, uh, since the, the, the early 90s. And they're located close to the urban service area that kind of cuts down on the travel time, uh, the hauling cost uh, to the demand areas, which are inside the urban service area. We've also had a few that came in out in the A3 area, our, our westernmost area. But those were all had direct access to State Road 60, even this mine here. And these were, were um, approved and essentially came about to supply uh, materials to the State Road 60 widening project. And that's, that's really the reason for their location. In Indian River County, mining has been allowed in agricultural areas for 40 years or more. You go back to the 1960s and it's allowed in there. It's not really mentioned in the 1950s uh, code requirements. This graphic illustrates the urban service area in red and then our three agricultural uh, uh, designated areas. Uh, this particular color here, mostly east of 95, is the AG1 area. Uh, it's five acre uh, minimum lot size, mostly east of US1. I'm sorry, mostly east of I-95, between I-95 and the urban service area. Uh, there's also uh, kind of a five acre area around Felsmere uh, that's still AG1. Then in this lighter shade of green is the AG2 area. Most of this area has been, uh, is land that's been cleared and used for agricultural production. And then we have the, basically the, the marsh and conservation area here that's, that's in, in white. And then uh, in the darker green is the AG3 area, um, 20 unit, I'm sorry, 20 acre uh, minimum lot size. Uh, there are reasons for allowing mines in the ag areas, uh, which is what the existing comp plan and, and regulations uh, allow for. There's a, it allows the necessary size of mining sites, the size requirements, require areas where there are, there are larger land holdings and, and parcels, and, and that's what you have in the AG areas. The coquina deposits, though they're, they're limited, do seem to be in the AG1 and AG2 areas on both sides, uh, somewhat of, of I-95, so that's where one of the resources uh, is located specifically. Uh, it's also proximity to the demand areas, especially in the AG1 areas. And uh, the, there's the kind of efficient delivery distance, which, um, again, staff went into this in some detail in the, uh, in the meeting packet. And the public works will go over uh, a little bit later. The long-term use is something also to keep in mind that the mining operation itself is really an interim land use. The long-term use are ponds and associated green space. And in the past, those have been used primarily either for residential, be, could be, uh, we've, we've had examples of these being converted to kind of suburban densities or rural residential densities or just uh, pond operations for, for ag. Um, the ag areas have larger sites and fewer people, and that's one of the 
uh, the aspects of the AG1 here is that there, there can be larger separations between uses, uh, which can be an advantage when there are conflicts, and also there are just fewer people. It's less dense. And the past experience has, has actually been a, a two-edged sword, really. There's been experience in the past with well-run mines that are not incompatible. There's always conflicts. There's always problems. It's a question of responsiveness and some of the best management practices that, that have been discussed. And obviously, the, you know, one of the reasons for the moratorium in, in these very workshops is that we've also had the other experience uh, the last year and a half or so along 82nd Avenue uh, with, with lots of conflicts and complaints. Um, one bit of information I wanted to, to share with you all, Lee County is toward the end of their, their one-year moratorium. That's over in September, and they've commissioned a very large study <laughs> They are one of those, those counties that have large mining operations. Uh, they have uh, aggregate resource, hard lime rock, large areas, large mining concerns. They have big regional, kind of regional wetland and conservation area issues and conflicts with, with their mining. But, so there are differences between <coughs> Indian River and Lee County, but uh, one of the, uh, the report that just came out at the very end of June uh, from Dover Coal and, and Partners, it's available online, is uh, an, an assessment of some of their, their land use practices. And one, one thing that they have recognized in, in their report is a difference between mining for fill dirt or sand versus, you know, exportable materials like the hard rock and the aggregate. And what uh, they've recommended in their study is that the, the fill dirt, which can be, you know, mined in, in, a, in various locations, it's not, you know, specifically resource dependent in one particular deposit area, should be located near demand areas. And that by doing that, you actually have fewer miles traveled with the, uh, the haul traffic and fewer roads affected and ultimately uh, fewer people affected in the, in the big picture. And that's what, what their recommendation is, is to, to kind of treat fill dirt and kind of the common mining, which is what most of what Indian River County has, a little bit differently than, than the rest of the mining activities, and to locate them uh, near to demand areas. Um, other counties, primarily uh, with sand and fill mining, like Indian River County, uh, have uh, conditional use approval allowances in agricultural areas. Uh, and that's in your backup material. That's results based on a survey by Lee County staff of uh, over two dozen counties. Also wanted to, to point out that the, the Indian River County's Agricultural Advisory Committee looked at the whole table of uses allowed in our agricultural areas. And when it came to mining, recommended that um, they did not, rec let me say what they did not recommend. They did not recommend that they be prohibited from any of the ag districts, but uh, to be a special exception use. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit further. That's more of a process uh, issue. Uh, compatibility uh, in defining it for purposes of uh, looking at, at land uses. Uh, we define this as location, arrangement, control of differing land uses in a manner that results in harmony among uses or coexistence with no significant conflicts between the uses. And the uh, approach to mining compatibility in Indian River County uh, in terms of the policies and the regulations that we have now and so far the potential regulations is really kind of in two steps. One is that at the end of the day, with the groundwater issues uh, to be addressed, reclaimed sites should complement agricultural and residential uses. The long-term ponds and associated green spaces, if done right, should be complementary. Uh, in an agricultural setting. And then the second part is, well, what about the interim use of 10 years during the life of the mine? And, and the uh, approach uh, in the comprehensive plan and in the LDRs, and so far in looking at potential regulations coming out of the first two workshops is to avoid significant conflicts by addressing the adverse impacts and to take what's actually causing the problems and addressing each one uh, specifically. The first two workshops looked at kind of generically three issues, really environmental, nuisances, and traffic, and potential regulations were, were identified. In the meeting or workshop backup, uh, we have a number of these, a whole list of potential regulations. Those are not worded to be, you know, all the specifics that an actual formal LER amendment would have, but to give essentially, you know, a statement of what the regulation would cover. There would be a lot more work to be done, but there are 30 
uh, potential regulations in the first two workshops that address conflicts. And that's really kind of the overlap between compatibility and, uh, and the first two workshops uh, that, that have already been conducted. One is addressing roads and traffic conditions. That's probably, when you get right down to it, the major complaint and conflict issue is what's going on on the roadways itself. It's the most difficult probably to, uh, to enforce and what we've had the most complaints about, especially along 82nd Avenue and, and more recently. And there's a number of uh, potential regulations that can address you know, specific parts of that, uh, of that potential conflict. Um, noise and vibration, same thing, on-site, but, but mostly off-site is where most of the concerns have been with what impacts the trucks have. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the adequate road surface maintenance uh, and speed control. Those are probably two of the, of the main noise and vibration type of uh, uh, aspects is the truck traffic itself. Degraded air quality is, again, on-site and off-site, but um, what is recommended so far is a comprehensive dust control plan that's on-site and off-site. And a lot of these issues, as you may remember, at the end of the last workshop, uh, we talked about coming up with a local you know, list or guidebook of best management practices, and we are putting that together I've, in the interim. I've, between this workshop and the last one, I've passed out to you all at one evening meeting uh, kind of where we are with that, uh, and we're even further along at, at, at coming up with something uh, that can, can handle some of those issues. The other issues were environmental, degraded surface waters, um, and a lot of these would require uh, more baseline data uh, and monitoring reports and so forth that would compare conditions over time to baseline conditions, and that includes surface water and groundwater level impacts, and also getting this kind of improved information and analysis to the agencies that have expertise, St. John's and DEP. Same with uh, groundwater contamination issues. Uh, one other item that really kind of gets to compatibility with, especially immediately adjacent properties, is protecting adjacent wetlands and upland areas, and uh, also making sure that none of the mining sites themselves, you know, wind up um, destroying wetlands or upland areas. But if you have larger sites where mines are allowed, there should be no. Uh, excavation of wetland areas or, or upland areas. They should be worked around. They should be set back from. That came out of the first workshop, and that's, that's what's addressed in some of these potential regulations. So again, the approach has been to look at the specific uh, potential uh, in conflict and, and the impacts that are associated with that conflict and address those point by point by point. Currently, our existing LDRs uh, allow mining in all the ag areas by administrative permit use. There's no formal notice, although we have instances where someone contacts us, they hear about a project, they see the signs that, that are required now. Um, when something is going to PNZ, they call us. If, they're in, if they call us and contact us, we contact them. We do this interested parties contact, but no formal notice with the administrative permit uh, process. There are specific land use criteria. It's a type of conditional use. And those uh, items come to the Planning and Zoning Commission approval. There's no Board of County Commissioners meeting unless an, application, an applicant or an affected party appeal it. With the special exception process, there is formal notice. There's an advertisement. It's a conditional use as well. And the county has broader discretion to attach compatibility conditions. There's a public hearing in front of the PNZ, and the final decisions made by the Board of County Commissioners at a, at a public hearing. And currently, with special exceptions, there's notices uh, for any, uh, the owner of any property within 300 feet of a project. And one possible change that, that staff analyzed and, and actually recommended in, in, the, in the report for this meeting is to expand this notice area. And we looked at, you know, that it's appropriate to expand this notice area in the ag areas because you have large parcels. You know, a 300 foot notice requirement might just hit immediately adjacent properties and not go far enough. So we looked at the half mile notice area that's required for communications towers in ag areas and felt that that was a precedent essentially and, and that, was a, that was a way of making sure if the county goes to expanded notice for mining operations that they, they notify as many people formally uh, as possible. So staff's conclusion was um, 
to continue to allow mines in the ag areas. Don't, don't prohibit them in any of our ag areas or reasons for allowing them uh, to happen there. And to address the impacts through the improved regulations. And one point that uh, is, I think, a major point, it's been talked about probably at every workshop so far, is actually the last workshop that we're going to have, the next one in August, and that's on compliance and enforcement. Um, it's true of any regulation. It's probably only as good as compliance and enforcement. So uh, that's a huge issue uh, that we're going to spend a whole workshop on talking about next next month. Staff also uh, has concluded that mining operations as a use should be reclassified to special exception use. That way it gets a higher level of scrutiny. There's more discretion uh, by the county in terms of fashioning compatibility uh, conditions. And it also, you know, kind of goes through more notice, allows more input, input at Planning and Zoning Commission and then ultimately input at the Board of County Commissioners. And then to have as one of the special exception use criteria this last item, an expanded notice, just like for communications towers in ag areas, have expanded notice half mile of any project site uh, mining site that's proposed in an, in an ag area. Um, that's it for the planning staff uh, presentation. I'd like to turn things over to Chris Moore for a moment to go over uh, some issues related to you know, local needs for fill and impact of distance from mines to demand areas because uh, that does have an impact on the appropriateness of, uh, of location. Chris. Okay. While he's setting up, Stan, I know the one thing, um, did we, uh, did you all do any research or look at numbers of mines, like together or groups or in, in, in areas? I mean, we talked about the compatibility or potential of having impacts of one, two, four, six mines. Right. There, up. Actually, as far as mines that have e either been approved or applied for, and even looking at the three <coughs> that were applied for, you know, Wild Turkey, Sanco, and Cairns. Right. Those actually have kind of maintained the same kind of separation as mines have had, you know, in previous decades around certain demand areas. Historically. Mm -hmm. but what's really kind of different about, uh, I'd say, the, the 82nd Avenue area is it's a pretty, it's a pretty long corridor. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a long north-south roadway. You've got about four and a half, five mile stretch in there. So it's a, uh, it has had, uh, in, in the case of Wild Turkey, where the third application to come through, it would be the third mine on that. But if you if you kind of look at the distances involved, it's, it's comparable to, to what what we've had before. Thank you. Okay, Chris. Oh. Could I ask two questions? Certainly. Give me a dollar for each one. <laughs> <laughs> Has there? Uh, I noticed you said that uh, Lee County is considering uh, closeness, in effect, of mines to where the dirt's going to be used. Have we ever had a map? that would show a single mine and then where that uh, material went? Do we have any kind of a map like that? I don't think we staff would have a map. I think actually the operators would have a better idea of where, and it probably, you know, maybe project by project. You know, they may have 20% going to individual lot owners and, in, say, Vero Lake Estates, but then several big projects that really got the bulk of the material. But I think we'd actually have to ask operators and, and maybe some of the public works staff would have a, okay. an idea about that. Another question was, um, I think at one of the, uh, the meetings we had someone that indicated that there was a study or uh, information as to the effect of truck vibration and how far it went with damage to homes. I'm sure that the materials between the two would certainly make a difference. But did you ever receive that? I did not receive that, but um, planning staff talked to public works staff after kind of to debrief after the last workshop. I'm talking about vibrations. Where would vibrations come? Apparently, the vibrations coming from trucks, not the on-site activity. And I'll let public works staff speak to that. But I, th I think I, I think the bottom line is the the condition of the roadway and the speed of the truck have a lot to do with the kind of the, the pounding that a truck will do at a particular location along a roadway and and how you how you mitigate against that uh, probably deals with the, maintaining the road surface and, the, and controlling the speeds. I was just wondering, Stan, because there was a specific study apparently that had been done, was available, and I know that I asked for a copy of it. I guess they just uh, didn't produce it. 
Thank you. Okay, any other questions before we go on to Public Works and Chris Moore? Okay. I said one. Okay. You, know, you talked about compatibility in ag and residential areas after the uh, mine is finished? Yes. In other words, the, 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 the mining, the way mining is set up as a use in Indian River County, the mining operation is really just an interim use. It's 10 years long. The, the, the long-term land use effect of the mining operation is a pond and whatever effects that has. And we got into dewatering and groundwater protection and so forth, and then the green area around it. What's, how's that going to essentially be converted to some other use? Is it long-term going to be just a pond for agriculture used for irrigation? Is it going to be an amenity to a residential um, uh, project or even if it's very, very low density? So I think you know, we were just recognizing the fact that it's a two-step type of land use, really. Uh, it's an interim use and then a long-term use. And we think both can be compatible um, if properly regulated. So are you going to have or thinking about guidelines in the long term, especially in agricultural areas? Certainly. Yeah. And, and we will have some. Right. And I think, in fact, one of the um, one of the items, and it depends on the particular issue that, that you're talking about. Obviously, there are uh, there are slope requirements. There are shape and literal zone requirements. Uh, there's groundwater monitoring that has to be going on. And there are jurisdictions that actually have the monitoring go on for a couple of years after the mine is reclaimed to look at its effect in its reclaimed state oh, as, as it goes I along. Can't. And so there, there are possibilities for looking at that, too. Other than residential areas. Yeah, right. In, what what we've yeah. tended to see is that it becomes, you know, an amenity to, uh, to, a, to a residential project. If, well, in an agricultural area, you're, you're, you're concerned, too, about keeping it in the agricultural area around the right, right. adjoining area. That's correct. You don't want any adverse impacts on vegetation of any type. Or inhibitation no. of uh, spraying or any other ac agriculture activities. Right. And that's why when you, when you look at the, uh, you know, there's, there's buffering requirements around the perimeters. There's setbacks to the, to the surface water itself that's being created and so forth. Aren't there, I, I, the reason I was curious about what he was saying is there aren't the state has huge reclamation requirements, right? The state, the state of Florida has reclamation requirements unto themselves, but through St. John's and everybody and other people, right? That, that's that's correct, as, as well as the county, and which affects and, any mine. The mines out on 60, they're in the agricultural area, or a mine that would be in a residential area has they they apply. There, there's no real separation of residential versus ag in the reclamation, is there? That's correct. In other words, you don't. They're they're going to be the same type of of requirements for the pond from from the county standpoint, whether it's being used, and it mostly deals with the edges, the slope. Right, the right. depth could vary greatly depending on the size of it. I, I have a question. Yeah, Jerry. Yeah, on the special exception um, classification change, you want to increase it to a half a mile of notification. Is there also notification in the newspapers? Yes. Legal notice yes. as well. Yes, for special exception. That's correct. So they would have both then? Yes, for, for both the Planning and Zoning Commission public hearing and the Board of County Commissioners hearing. Ads for both. Ads for both in the paper. Okay. Thank you. Any, any other questions? All right. Da, da, da. Now, Chris. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Chris Moore. I'm the Assistant Public Works Director for the county. We've got a couple issues that we're going to cover um, between myself and Jim Davis. Uh, I'm going to run through an example. Uh, community Development asked us to look at an example of the associated costs or additional costs in developing a lot typical quarter acre lot uh, if the um, if the mine that provides the fill for that lot were actually moved five miles further out. Uh, I'm going to run through an example on that and then um, Jim will talk about our local uh, needs for mining fill as far as our road building projects and our, also our road and bridge division. Uh, Stan, if you could flip the um, What you see here circled in, in red is the a typical there are calculation showing the additional costs associated with moving a mine 
uh, five miles further out from where it is today if it were to be used for a lot uh, filling. If you take a typical, in this case we use Vero Lake Estates, but if you take a typical quarter acre section of a lot, <clears throat> which would be 10,890 square feet, and if you had to bring that quarter acre up two feet of fill, uh, you take the 10,890 times two feet to get the number of cubic feet, then divide by 27, uh, 27 cubic feet in a cubic yard, you end up with roughly 800 uh, cubic yards of fill needed to be brought in to bring a lot up two feet. Divide that 807 cubic yards by 15 uh, yards per truck. It's roughly 54 truck loads. And then you multiply that 54 trucks times an additional 10 miles, five miles out, five miles back, uh, times $2.13 a mile, and you're adding uh, roughly $1,150 to the uh, cost of a, of a lot filling operation. Now the $2.13 uh, per mile of cost uh, would include the cost of the additional diesel fuel uh, for a mile and an additional dollar for um, depreciation of the truck. We used a buck a mile for depreciation, depreciation of the truck and a dollar thirteen for fuel, so that's two thirteen per mile. That would not include drivers' uh, salaries, insurance costs, uh, fees that would be uh, inherent with, with owning the truck and operating it, but just per mile costs in fuel and depreciation at $2.13 a mile would add roughly $1,150 to the cost of, of filling that lot. Now, this was done, uh, these diesel fuel costs are about three months old, so they're actually a little bit higher now because diesel's up around 490, uh, 480, 490 a gallon. Uh, so using today's uh, diesel fuel cost, it'd actually be a little over $1,200 additional cost to fill a lot. And then I'll let, um, I'll let Jim Davis speak to our One, local Chris, manager. real quick, one thing in the sure. footnote or the down below, the, most people don't fill the entire lot. So in your example, if you were thinking if bigger lots may cost more money, but in reality, I mean, it, it may just be that cost. Right, exactly. I mean, most people, when they if they own a much larger lot, an acre and a half or an acre, they typically won't fill the whole lot, but they'll they'll fill up to the house pad and then taper the lot back down to existing uh, grade at the at the uh, property boundaries. But we used uh, a quarter acre of fill at two feet to just use a standard example. Right. Okay. Thank you. Now, one thing I wanted to talk about a little bit before. Um, I give it to Jim, is uh, there would be most likely additional cost to the mine in that um, if the mine is located further out, they may not be able to process the same number of trucks in a day because the trucks would take longer to get back and forth to their target. Um, so if the, if the number of uh, trucks uh, servicing a mine were a fixed amount, um, then they would end up processing fewer loads because the, the length of the haul route is actually longer. But if, if, if true economic uh, theory came into effect and the number of trucks servicing that mine expanded to fill the capability of the mine and it was considered variable, then that, then that may not, um, the reduced revenue may not be um, come into play. But it, we'd have to have a lot more details in order to calculate the effects of reduced revenue on the mines by just being located five miles further out. Mm -hmm. and that's all I had on that. I'll Thank you. Let Jim speak. Jim. Uh, Jim Davis, Public Works Director. Uh, I'd like to comment on the use of uh, fill material in the county. There are two primary users. Uh, in our county as well as probably throughout the state and the nation. You, you have the private sector use, which in our county, uh, of course, depends on the um, activity, the construction activity in one particular year. And, and, of course, that's varied tremendously. But you can anticipate in Indian River County that probably over a million cubic yards of material uh, is used locally. Uh, probably in a medium to slow year, uh, a very aggressive year when development is uh, probably full steam ahead. You're talking 
more than two, three, four million cubic yards potentially. And uh, the private sector use, uh, the cost uh, historically uh, three or four or five years ago were somewhere around four to five dollars a cubic yard. That's the material itself, which used to run between a dollar, two dollars a cubic yard. Uh, and also the transportation of it. We used to use 18 cents per ton per mile for the trucking, but as Chris just mentioned, with fuel going up uh, so rapidly, that's gone up probably to 40 cents per mile per ton. Uh, now I'm speaking in terms of tonnage, and uh, Chris was speaking in terms of cubic yard. But most mines have scales, and you can measure the weight of the truck before and after. Uh, and they market the material mostly on tonnage, uh, although some people buy by the cubic yard. And they load a 20-yard truck and anticipate that's probably 20 yards. As far as the... Uh, the private use uh, subdivisions these days try to balance their cut and fill. Uh, they have to excavate large stormwater ponds. And most engineers locally do the best they can to try to balance cut and fill. Particularly in the 100-year floodplain, which is most of our county west of Kings Highway, uh, those uh, stormwater management tracks have to be much larger because uh, in order to put fill within the floodplain, you have to excavate fill uh, within that same area in the floodplain. And that keeps the flood floodplain storage about equal. So uh, when you're in the 100-year floodplain west of town, you're creating larger stormwater tracks, you're balancing your cut and fill, and probably importing uh, less material than back in the days when we didn't have stormwater management lakes. Uh, in the eastern part of the county where you can get perhaps higher densities uh, and you don't have that floodplain storage requirement, there's probably more importation of fill. Uh, you know, there's certain projects. Uh, I know of a seven-acre track now that uh, where a church is being built. They're importing about 20,000 cubic yards of fill. So at today's cost, maybe five, six dollars a cubic yard, for the fill and the placement and the grading, uh, they're talking $100,000 just to build a church uh, in the county. So the use of the material uh, in the private sector is very difficult to uh, estimate. It just depends on the, uh, the development activity in, in one particular year. The public sector, the county itself, purchases about $100,000 worth of fill a year. And that fill has to be a, a better quality material. It's called stabilizer. And we use that on the unimproved road network. So it has to have a bearing capacity that is stronger than just uh, fill that's used for a, perhaps a yard or a development. It has to have a little more clay in it. And it has to be able to get density uh, so that it can support uh, the weight of vehicles on a daily basis. Uh, that material we pay about $4 a ton for. A few years ago, we used to pay $2 a ton. So with our $100,000 that's budgeted every year, we're probably purchasing 25,000 cubic yards of stabilizer. Uh, we do use general fill that's not stabilizer for park projects and, and other projects that we have. Uh, but that's minimal compared to the material we put on the uh, 260 miles of unpaved roads that we maintain. Uh, if you move that fill further from the county, uh, then that <coughs> trucking cost will go up. And, and trucking cost, of course, uh, has gone up dramatically due to uh, the fuel costs. But also the risk management side of trucking has increased. Uh, insurance has increased. Uh, heavy dump trucks, uh, you know, are a liability <coughs> if uh, the operators aren't careful. So there is a risk management side of that. So the longer you truck the fill, uh, the more lane miles of roads uh, that truck is traveling in a day. 
uh, the risk management will go up as well as the cost uh, and the wear and tear on the roads. Uh, most of the vibration and the wear and tear uh, from the, the truck is caused by impact loads. The smoother the surface, the less impact, the less vibration. Uh, the only complaints we have received in the county uh, due to vibration has been when we're building roads and we're using a vibratory roller, and that roller has a vibratory mechanism where those steel drums are vibrating to compact the material, then perhaps a quarter to a half a mile radius, uh, we get uh, occasional uh, vibration complaints. Uh, we, we had that problem when we built uh, Round Island Park in the southern part of the county. A few of those oceanfront property owners called and said, you know, my china's shaking in the china closet. So we simply turn off the vibratory uh, mechanism and static roll the material. Uh, static rolling takes longer. You have to make more passes. You don't achieve the, the density quick enough, uh, but you can static roll. As far as a dump truck, uh, if you're, they're traveling on a poorly maintained road with a lot of washboarding, I would think within a quarter to uh, perhaps at the longest, I think a half a mile, you, know, you may get some uh, vibration complaints. Uh, that's pretty much the, uh, the gist, I think, of, of what I wanted to communicate to you. I'd be glad to answer any questions regarding the use of the material, private versus public or vibration. Okay. Any questions for Jim? I have a question regarding the vibration. Um, I was really hoping we would have those reports. Uh, I know we have not received, people have not been talking to us about complaints because of, of you know, vibrating to stabilize the road surface. They've been complaining about vibrations from the mining operations from the dump trucks. And I think there, there is a woman in the, in, who was here and was actually saying that her her china was walking off the shelf. So you you say that the vibration is only felt for a half a mile? Up to. I'm saying that, that that's our experience based on complaints that we have received uh, on on our projects and on on trucking complaints. What about the complaints that were in South Count, uh, South Florida about the um, actually affecting the, the structure itself. The structure of the house, with a lot of people are complaining about the house cracking and settling and caused by the vibrations. That's a little bit more than China just walking off the shelf. That's other, that's a lot heavier impact to a home. Is, can you tell me, have you seen any numbers on that? Are we still talking a half mile? Are we talking a quarter mile? What are the studies? Well, uh, the, the vibrations going to carry based on the geology of, of the land area. Uh, if you're in Rock Ridge, which has a thin layer of lamb rock in the surface of the ground, that lamb rock is going to pick up the vibration and transmit it a longer distance. So if, if the subsurface of the ground is very, very dense and consolidated, vibration will carry further. If you have loose sandy soils uh, subsurface, like most of west of the county, west of the One Mile Ridge, you have very, uh, I don't know of any rock lenses you have that are shallow, uh, you're not going to transmit vibration, in my opinion, much longer than a quarter to half a mile. The, the reality I don't know what happened in South Florida. If they're if they're mining uh, Miami Udalite, which is lamb rock in South Florida, mm -hmm. that's a dense uh, substrate, and that vibration is going to carry much further with a dense substrate due to the, the geological uh, characteristics than sandy soils. Jim, there were also complaints from 82nd Avenue about structural damage to homes. Perhaps within a quarter, half a mile away. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if uh, if those trucks are, are traveling full, heavy frequency, uh, bad washboardy conditions, 
You know, that, I wouldn't say that's not possible. I mean, that's, that was my, what I was going to say is from a realistic standpoint, if we're talking about vibrations on trucks from a mining operation, we only have a few options. One has starts with the route. Whether, we've got to determine, which is in our recommendations, determine the best route we can. But the second thing was is that it has to be do with the road condition and the speed of the truck. If you can, and those three items, I mean, is that, I mean, if we can, if we can, Either we either control that or we don't. I mean, we can't. I don't think you're going to stop vibrations on trucks. I'd like to. So you either reroute them or figure out a route that avoids, you know, the most sensitive areas, or you, and you maintain the road and you maintain the speed of the trucks. The only thing I, is, am I missing something? And in, in you recommend that? I mean, because there's anything else we could do to alleviate vibrating on trucks on the mining operation. Aren't there different types of trucks would be different uh, vibration rate? You know, a dump truck is versus a tractor trailer truck or using the third uh, axle more often and things like that would stop some of that vibration? Is there any studies on that, that you know, the, the smaller mm -hmm. tractor trails that you see going around? Well, not that I know of to directly on point of what you indicated as far as type of truck. You know, the braking, uh, the you know, when brake, a truck yeah. brakes and uses those jake brakes yeah. like... Yeah. I think you had a presentation on that Chris spoke of a few months ago, perhaps. Uh, the braking on a washboardy road is a, can be a problem. But, but that's back to the condition of the road. No, that's the condition of the road, yeah. And, and yeah, also the, the substrate. Right. You know, that, that vibration has to travel from that wheel load to a residence or whatever. And if you have loose, sandy soils, if you have a canal in between, if, if you have some of these... Uh, geological. I guess what I'm driving at, Jim, is there, from a regulatory standpoint, which is what, if you listen to Stan's report, we've got this 30 list of items that we want to try and deal with to alleviate many of the complaints we're having. Is there any, I mean, I don't remember seeing anything in there other than what I just said, which would be route, the condition of the road and speed of trucks. It might affect, maybe that we did, we did talk about the jack brakes, but they would affect, in effect, stop the vibration unless you can I mean is there anything specific from a regulatory standpoint can you figure out a way to do that better than what we're we're talking Jim, about? Jim it would seem that if you know the conditions of the soil of the road and you put them in and the conditions surrounding it for a quarter to a half a mile you know you're getting home structural damage it would seem that there would be some type of matrix associated with truck speed and those other conditions that could determine how fast that truck can go on under those conditions to reduce the structural damage to the home. I know, no, uh, I know of no models or computer models or anything that, that really do that. There, there may be some out there, but we haven't been posed with that problem historically on the last 27 years I've been in this county. I haven't received that much complaint regarding vibration caused by trucks. How do you set the speed of the trucks? Well, the, the roads themselves have a speed limit. Uh, you know, on a rural road, we try to keep them 30, 35 miles an hour. When they get up to 50, 55, I think that compounds a problem. But if we can keep the trucks on that dirt road 30, 35, uh, and, you know, that reduces the braking because so are the truck, the less braking you have. But I don't know of any studies or models. You know, they almost have to be in a particular area. I mean, what, you may do a study in Lookout Mountain, Georgia, where you have a rock substrate, and that's quite different than sandy soil Florida, where you have uh, totally different geology. Jim, I have, I have a question. Since we have to convert this discussion into regulations, right? Um, I'm would really, really like to know the difference of the impact of vibrations between having a road asphalt versus sand. Because we may be looking at requiring the, the road be paved if there's going to be a mine there. And that could be one of the regulations that we're going to be looking at. And I, and I really would like to have that information so we know whether or not it's, it's going to be of value to the county to say we need a paved road instead of a dirt road. So where can we get that information? Um, I, I do not know of any comparisons in this area. From I assume if you pave that road, then the vibration is probably going to go 
be left. To, to nothing. Right. But I don't want to make a developer pay hundreds of thousands of dollars on an assumption that it's going to be better. Um, I, I think I really would like to come up with some place where we can actually find a study. Uh, I don't know if Chuck has any information on that. Or The good news is we don't have to do that today, right? All right. Good. <laughs> and maybe the type of make a maybe, note. Somebody yeah. write that down. I'll take that as an assignment. Maybe yeah. some of these yeah. counties that have that are, are are you know more active in the mining would have some of those statistics. Yeah. And would the type of truck make a difference? More axles. Um, the, again, the tractor trailer would that be less vibration because it, the weight is spread differently? Same same load, you know, 15, <coughs> twenty yard load. Well, in most uh, axle weight, 18,000-pound 18, 18, axle weights are the industry standard. So whether you have a, uh, a tractor-trailer truck that has more axles, usually they have longer uh, containers. Yeah, but they don't have a solid chassis that runs through the, with the motor and everything in the tractor-trailer type situation. Uh, I don't know if that would mean a lot, but I think it might mean something in vibration. And uh, I see a lot of these trucks going with a full load without the third axle down. You know, the, the dump trucks that had that third axle, they still keep them up when they're driving with a full load. Yeah, well, the, but that dump, would be enforcement. Yeah. Uh, dump, dump trucks are used to haul fill because uh, there are certain characteristics that allow them to place that place fill, uh, you know, once they get on site. Yeah. You know, tractor trailer trucks are different operation. Uh, usually, you have to have a much larger project, more room to operate. To well, turn I have these tractor trail trucks that are only still 20 yards. They have that small uh, well, they're, bed they're in the They're still back. a little different operation. So they wouldn't tip over. Is I, the main I still, reason. I still think if we deal with if 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 this is where, if you deal with speed, numbers of trucks, right. type of surface, you'll you'll begin to minimize that, and maybe you can hit that happy median. So we really need to stay with something and we can grasp right now without going out. Too far in the left field because if we stay on point, we can we may be able to get some other stuff done too. Yeah. Large dewatering pumps can also cause vibration. I, I have seen on site. Right. I mean that's large diesel pumps if they're not properly mounted. And mm -hmm. If staff is currently thinking that it would probably be best to have uh, small mines, perhaps closer to. Uh, major source. subdivisions, right. if that is something you're thinking about based on what you said when you began. We have to be careful about the, you know, the oh, vibrations. Yeah. Because yeah. How, do you, you know, how do you cause that to occur? I mean, people that want to develop the mines, I mean, they're the driving force and where they want to apply for a permit for a, for a mine, even though, obviously, the closer you get, you get on a major arterial, you wouldn't have the damage or that we currently have on like 82nd. Just if I could could respond one, um, and really, I mean, this this really is kind of the same issue you would have inside the urban service area with a non-mine development that right. has, like, as Jim was mentioning earlier, a, you know, any type of subdivision uh, west of 43rd in the South County, especially, is going to have a large stormwater area. There's going to be excavation and, and moving on site and so forth. So, and it is going to depend on very local conditions, probably, with respect well, to Well, those dump trucks are going somewhere with the fill, so they have to drive in there and dump them and then go back out. So, right. I mean, I, I, I just think that, we, you know, we've heard complaints on vibration, but in this case, good, bad, or indifferent, we've had with, we had a serious complaint on 82nd Avenue, but unless Jim knows of others or Chris knows of others or somebody at staff knows of numerous complaints over, let's say, 10 or 15 years, we've done a huge amount of development inside the urban service area, some on the outside. And I haven't, I, this is not one of the complaints I hear much in mine. Yeah. I hear speed, I hear other complaints off and on, but not this. So, I mean, that's why I'm not trying to blow it off, but I just think we may be making a lot out of something right now that has not been a big issue. Thank you. Okay? Mike, take that. All right. Take the hint. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions, either Stan, Chris, or Jim, um, from you all? Are the thoughts about the process on what we, where we stand? Stan, did you want to go through any of the items that, you know, we have, you, you put them up quickly, but I mean, we do have, there's 30 items of which we're going to attempt to address regulation that 
other and above, either we have already or or not. I didn't know how you wanted to do that. You want to do it before or after public? Well, I, I didn't spend a lot of time on them just because it's in it's in the backup material, and I just kind of summarize them on the slides. Uh, just that. Right, we'll see what the comments we get. Right. Okay. I think so. <clears throat> All right. Anybody else? All right. We're gonna we're gonna open this up for a public discussion. Um, I will start over on the, this side or whoever feels like it. We've got two mics. That if it looks like it's going to be fast and furious, we can use them both. If not, come on down and one at a time, whatever. The speakers, speaking areas are open. Public hearing is now open. Lord have mercy. One first candidate shows up. <laughs> but I, I live in an affected area, so <laughs> that is why I'm here. Uh, my name is Susan Boyd. Uh, I am... I guess I should disclose that I am a candidate for county commissioner, but major reason I'm here is because I do live off of 82nd Avenue, and some lines do affect me. Um, I, I only had a couple of comments, and they're very short, because I'm only basing on what I've heard today. So one of my comments would be what you just talked about. Uh, basically, you were talking about um, trucks, mining trucks that would be going into a development to build a house. I would point out that that would just be maybe a day or two or a couple of days. In the case of a development, it would be pretty intermittent. Maybe they're going to build 10 at a time for a while, and they do it, and it's finished. Mm -hmm. But if you happen to live on the egress route, the route where trucks are going past your house all day long, six or seven days a week for 10 years, you're in a completely you're different sure. situation. Okay. So I just wanted to point out that it's, it's an apples and oranges thing. So that it's very, I would uh, ask you please to just keep into consideration that it is a very different situation that if your house is located near the mine, which would be going to many different places, but it's going past your house all the time. So that would be the, the main thing. If you give me one second, because it was hard to take notes. And take it you might back up just a little <laughs> bit, Susan. It's oh, I always yeah. do that. With it. Is that yeah. better? Yeah. Yes. It was oh, beginning to vibrate up here. So. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> And I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, I want to know what it feels like. <laughs> oh, um, I did have, yeah, I would think that, uh, beca uh, that for notification purposes, my suggestion would be that people be notified all along the egress route. Because you may be a mile down from the mine, but the truck still be, could be going past your house every single day. So I understand the half mile, but maybe we should take a look at the whole planned egress route and notification should go all along that route because all the people on that route would be uh, affected. We do, uh, sometimes there are several routes. You know, once you, as you get further out, it's like a spider's web. Um, maybe there's a, uh, a way to ha ask staff to, staff to look at where the truck traffic, whatever percentage of the truck traffic is going. You know, if we allow 200 trucks a day and 100 are going one way, um, and it's something we can look at. Something like that. Right. And, and right. for today, that's, that's all I have. So thank you very much. I always, uh, 8025 24th Street, and I always appreciate being able to come to public meetings, and I appreciate your listening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boyd. Um, anybody else? On this side over here, Dee Afternoon, Commissioners. Victor Knight, 3295 Ranch Road. Uh, I want to share a couple of thoughts that I expressed at the original uh, public hearings when the moratorium was, was uh, enacted. And there's no question that what was going on in the 82nd Avenue corridor was the catalyst for this, this whole situation. And all of that truck traffic that Ms. Boyd was alluding to was going down 82nd or 69th Street. Um, the proposal for Wild Turkey to come online, uh, that project, uh, I think there was some discussion about that being a 20-year project. I was reading through the staff report, which is a tremendous amount of work, and I, I applaud everybody for the, the, the input that they put into this thing, but I don't look at 10 years as being a temporary use, and certainly a 20-year project is far from it. Six months is temporary. Um, 10 years is long-term planning for, <laughs> for me. Uh, and those kinds of impacts along haul routes 
uh, which create these, uh, these vibrations and so forth. You've got so many complaints about. In the past, mines were pretty far off the beaten path. Yes, they were on the ridge where Red Stick Golf Course is right now. And yes, they're, they've been beautified and reclaimed and are now part of a beautiful golf course. But at the time that those were permitted 30 years ago, there wasn't anybody out there to complain about it. I find it a little troubling that the overall conclusion that mining is compatible in Ag 1, 2, and 3 districts if properly regulated. I would submit to you that we need to look at the Ag 1 district as distinctly different. As Mr. Hamner knows, I believe, there's very little legitimate agriculture left in the Ag 1 district. It really has become a low-density residential district. People have bought into this idea. In fact, the comp plans and the LDRs have been changed to allow for planned developments in those agricultural communities where you, you cluster and you uh, create an amenity base. Uh, if uh, a, a mine was proposed just south of the polo grounds on the Gadry property, which is a half a section or 320 acres. If one had been proposed there, these chambers would have been full of a whole lot more people than what the 82nd Avenue folks complained about it in pertaining to wild turkey. Because again, there was no notification, the administrative approval. I do think that it's ramping this thing up that uh, you go to a uh, 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 a, special exception. a special exception and provide notification, but 300 feet, no, uh, no, you know, that ain't going to cut it. <laughs> you, you, you've got so many more people that are impacted. And uh, I would submit that if you look at the Ag 1 district as more of a low density residential, you've got uh, two projects coming in up around the Quail Valley Golf Course where they, they're in the Ag District, it's one to five zoning, they're going to cluster their homes around uh, beautiful lakes and so forth. This is a residential district. I would, I would submit if I had my, my preferences and if I had the decision to make to eliminate many of the incompatibility issues, I would eliminate mining from the Ag 1 district period and make sure that it's all west of I-95. And I, I hear this uh, five-mile hauling cost of another $1,100 per lot for the fill. Hey, costs are going up all over the place, and uh, $1,100 is not a, not a big thing. We're talking about uh, impact fees going up another 70%, and, and I, I don't like the sound of that. Uh, you know, I'm a developer too, but, uh, you know, th some of these costs uh, are, are commensurate with the development, and, and they need to be borne by the, uh, you know, in the right parties. And, and just sticking a mine where it happens to be convenient I pointed out to the commissioners, uh, the Board of County Commissioners, that I've got 40 acres of ag land inside the, uh, the Urban Service District. It has rock on it. And I was approached by a rock mining company to, to, uh, to mine that property. Why don't we just do it right down on Henry River Boulevard and have it right in your back door? Um, Dee, how do you deal with, because the, it's not the chicken or the egg, but how do you deal with the fact if you're a golf course or if you're a residential, these uh, areas around Quail Valley that want to put in lakes for their lots, how would you suggest that we deal with the fact that they are still those are sand mines, permitted sand mines, as they exist today? Now, there was a suggestion. There was there was a suggestion made about the, um, and we never reached a real definition, but there was some conversation about being commercial versus. I say domestically or on on site. There's a limitation about what could go off site, because so, some places can't absorb all their all their sand. Right. There, I think that I talked to Stan about it, and Stan can correct me. But there's a there's a time frame involved. I think we give people six months. Is that in in, in there on on those on the lakes like the in, incidental to construction for any sized development is two months a two month window to haul off site. But for larger uh, developments 350 acres or larger, right. they can go up to 18 months to haul off site. Haul off so, site. But I mean, let's say we've got a, high, a, th a piece of property then that's 400 acres somewhere in the middle of this Ag One area, and they want to put in um, the a lake, but they want to sell half of their fill off of it. Now, how, how would that affect 
you know, we, how does that balance out? Well, again, the, the, the difference is that it's a shorter period of time. It's 18 months versus, versus 10 years. So, it's so incidental is, is, to, the, to the development. Because I think this is where we were a little unclear about this declaration. Is it, are you commercial or are you not commercial? I mean, is that, a, is that why, how you get to that point? To get the 10-year window, right? Well, well, one case it's it's shorter time period and it's incidental to the to the development activity itself on site versus you know a mining operation, which true is um, I don't think I said temporary, but it is interim use. Ten years can be a very long time. I understand that, uh, but it's it's just a it's just a longer period of time, and uh, there there are many more regulations. So what we're dealing with are the long longer term 10-year mining operations and and one of the differences between a mining operation and incidental to construction is incidental to construction can occur in districts other than agricultural districts to give you an example the waterway village the devasta project oh. has a incidental to my uh, to development mining permit so they do have the 18 months to to take fill off the site to me, that's. Okay. Uh, I'm glad you asked the question, and it, to me, it's just common sense. Anything that's that's ancillary to a project, incidental to a project, I just exempt it. If there is uh, uh, some excess uh, fill or, or burden that needs to be shipped off site, and that's that's probably. Uh, well, it requires a lot. I mean, it requires the the person doing the calculation of the dirt to be as accurate as they can, because if you know you've got. 30% of the dirt that's got to go off site. You have 18 months to get it off. You've got to, to move. I don't know if that's, you know, it, it, we may be, the, I'm, the reason I was asking the other side of it is you may be creating more truck traffic during a, at least it's a short period of time while they get it get it gone. Yeah, but how often will it be that you need to uh, take sand or, or dirt off of a site most of the time? More often than, it's more really? often than not, yeah. You're really going to have to overdig uh, the, the site, though. Uh, you you, you want to, you know, maximize your developable area. And having been through this uh, fairly recently, I was delighted to find that I had like. material on site that I could use and never brought one truckload of material onto the, uh, the site. Um, if I'd continued digging, I could have been, you know, in the mining business. Um, but I, I think that, uh, you know, some common sense approach to anything that's incidental to a project. But other than that, full-scale mining operations, um, you know, east of I-95, uh, there are very few places where you would not impact. And I, one comes to mind. Uh, there's 3,000 acres bordering uh, State Road 510 owned by the Graves family. If they put mines in the middle of that and, and take that material out to State Road 510, uh, they, they would have less impact on anybody else. But if you don't have a site that's big enough and going into a paved uh, uh, infrastructure, you, you're going to have, uh, you know, a huge amount of, of complaints. But if, if I had my preference, I'd love to see it eliminated from the Ag-1 district. Keep it uh, west of I-95. By the way, a, a lot of material that came out of the 82nd Avenue mines in the last six months went to Melbourne. It uh, went out 510 and went up by 95 and, and uh, filling in a couple of different projects. You, up there. Do you, and as an opinion, do you think that the situation on trucking or um, traffic would have been different if 82nd had been paved if the county had the road in? Where I'm located, I probably wouldn't have uh, too many uh, objections. Some of the others, some of the complaints have been lessened. But when you look at the size and magnitude of the project that was proposed for uh, the Wild Turkey project, you'd have had a, a virtual train of trucks down there at the intersection of State Road 60 and, um, and 82nd Second Avenue, Avenue, back all the way up to 26th Street, and. Folks in the in several neighborhoods uh, in there that that's a that's quite a, a burden a heck of a noise uh, 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 pollution problem and um, but but the paving would have helped no question it would have would have alleviated some of the uh, the challenges and I know 82nd is is uh, slated to be paved uh, sometime within our lifetimes but maybe in our lifetimes by the time I get the uh, Oslo Road interchange probably yeah we talked about that 30 years ago. <laughs> Is it possible to, uh, in a, you know, we, we have planning and zoning. We had zone. We had so many houses in, a, in an area. 
why can't we have it? just so many minds in an area operating at the same time? And then when one's not operating, then it allows somebody else to go in there. I mean, I don't see why we need to have the same rules and regulations for, for the three ag areas at the same time as what Mr. Knight's bringing up. And, uh, and even within the, like a zone, uh, the ag zone one, you would have only so many active mines at one time. And if somebody's not active, then it would allow maybe uh, wild turkey to go in there if the next one down is not functioning so well. Well, especially the whole roots right. that we talked about. If it was different whole roots, it would be a different story also. So you're only allowing a certain number to be operating at one particular time. Yeah, I, I guess your objective in doing that would be to reduce the volume okay. of truck traffic. So you could, I don't think it would matter if you had mining operations in the Ag one area north of sixty and then south of sixty because those don't really impact each other. Okay, but right. but what you're talking about is limiting the number of mines in a short distance or in an area that will impact mm -hmm. one haul route. Right. And I and I think that's something we can look at. But again, it comes back to How do you what's that? what's the volume that is desirable Except, or necessary because yeah. we do look at capacity of roadways mm -hmm. and you know 82nd Avenue south of 60 is a truck route and it, and north of 60 will be a truck route when it's when it's completed so and it was originally designed and and the entire improvement of 82nd Avenue is predicated on the concept of citrus highway the idea of citrus right. trucks so well, they, there will not be, in our lifetime <laughs> they, they, <laughs> there are fewer now obviously but but you know there there will be more volume when it is done Right. Well, when it's done, we could we allow more volume. Right now, we'd have to allow less. That is my point. Right. Point to the little thing we got in the in our pack. It was 2011. It might be finished. <laughs> I know. That yeah. That's um. It, it's going to be a funding constraint. It's I think 60 percent designed right now. So it's gone through. The first phase and almost the second phase has gone through project development, environmental, the PD&E phase. It, they're almost done with design. Then they still have to go through the right-of-way acquisition and construction phases, but it'll be a lot later than 2011. I, I don't want to break this up, but we really are not talking about just 82nd yes. Avenue today. I, I, and I'm and not, not going to talk about thank that. Thank you. Let me give one, one last point, and I'll wrap it up. Other counties, numerous other counties, are very progressive in addressing this and have designated special mining districts. And right. so I would submit to you to, that we should look at that. Um, I don't want to just throw everything out in Ag 2 and Ag 3 because uh, it, certainly some people are going to be impacted. But you really need to think hard about eliminating this uh, um, uh, option from that bundle of rights on everything in the Ag, uh, Ag 1 district. And uh, I really appreciate your time and, and thank you. The special the, exception the use, Davy. The special exception use is a big, is a, is a fairly big change. It's a big change, uh, but but the notice. It's not. It's not doing away with it, Mike. And if we could be assured that the public hearing process would would protect those rights, uh, I can tell you there's a lot of folks out there that have, have already talked to uh, you know attorneys about. Well, if this this goes forward, then we're going to file a class action lawsuit because this situation has now damaged all of these properties. I've been approached. I'm not part of that group, but I just you know that, that's a big issue. I mean, it's not that's not me. I uh, but I'm sharing that with you. So you've right. you've got to you got to look at this as a residential district. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Davey. Okay. Yes, ma'am. No. Oh, wait a minute. Excuse me. I we she stood patiently in the back forever. I couldn't get. I couldn't motion her to sit down <laughs> for her own good. But. Once I was up, I stayed there. I'm Linda Mitchell. I live at 8340 65th Street, and I emailed a letter that I asked be shared with you all, but I don't know if it got to you in time. Um, I'm, I'm going to try very hard not to be redundant, but we were asked at the last workshop to go ahead and complain when there were concerns. Most of my concern right now is probably going to be addressed more at the next workshop, and it's about compliance and enforcement. And that's my biggest concern. I, I saw better your perspective about your definition of compatibility, compatibility and what, what a complex situation you are looking at, and I'm respectful of that. 
But when you talk about $1,100 per truck or whatever your number was there, I hope we are also going to be looking at what would it cost to really be able to enforce the regulations because they are not being followed. They absolutely are not right now. And to me, what would have to change is there would have to be two policemen whose full-time job is to stand at the mines and to stand near the routes of the trucks. As soon as the trucks know there's nobody looking at them, they're not following the rules, and it's dangerous. A patient of mine who has an elderly grandfather who drove him to my farm two weeks ago could have been killed. We watched a truck tailgate him, just totally impatient, tailgating him. He was going fairly slow on the dirt road. It was a matter of a quarter of a mile until he got to the pavement. The truck passed him on the curve. The man probably didn't even know he was there behind him. And that's just one example. And so that's just my plea that we also look at, let's compare these costs and let's look at safety and health and welfare, and is it going to be better to put some money into having it enforced if we're going to allow it at all, or is it better to not allow it at all? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Come. Good Come afternoon. On. My name is Amy Banov. I'm an architect in town. I'm also a resident of um, the 69th Street area. And I have a couple of items, um, one to concur with the previous item. Um, I noticed right after the um, two mines were held to their original haul routes that the problem actually got way worse up on 69th Street because they were diverting south on 82nd Avenue. And now it has gotten a little bit better as people are not looking quite as strongly. Um, secondly, I do think you have to look at the cumulative impact of various mines, the concept of how many trucks are on the, the volume of the roads at one time. Thirdly, the, the notice information. I also had the note that it shouldn't just be a half mile from the mine. A half mile in ag zoning could be two or three property owners. But all along the, the haul route, that's where you'll get your most impact. And finally, um, I really think you need to look at the zoning code very carefully in terms of ag and when you get done with this current issue, don't put it all to bed and sweep it away. You really should look at all of the items in the ag zoning. If you look at um, our matrix, you'll see almost all of them, A1, A2, A3, go right down the list, identical, PPP, SSS, if it's the same exact um, permitting process are applied to all, and they, they are not all equal anymore. They might have been 40, 60 years ago when the ags were separated into ag 1, ag 2, and 3. But now, as Victor said, people have encroached into those ag zoning for things other than ag, and you need to evaluate very seriously what items are going to bring the people out because it's an issue. You know, today it's a mine. Next year it might be a recycling center. The year after it might be something else on this list. So I would encourage you to look very hard at that. Um, most counties zoning provides these natural buffers from the most con industrial and the most um, concentrated uses to the lower ones. And our ag zones seem to be able to do that from just the geography. Ag 1 can be that buffer as it gets farther out to the Ag 2 and Ag 3 and into the r more rural areas. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. My name is Al Vadiri, <coughs> excuse me, and I live at uh, Westside Villas. At the last meeting, I brought up a couple of points, and I was just wondering if they have been addressed or I didn't hear anything mentioned about it. Uh, I noticed in the presentation that there was a uh, seven to five. There's some time zones. Yes, time there, zone. There, uh, there are current rules to that effect. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I had mentioned that uh, living in Westside Villas seven to ten would probably be an intolerable situation. Uh, so seven to five. Uh, seven to five. I'm right. sorry. Right. Uh, we we have a light, as you know, on 60th and 82nd Avenue, uh, if you had 60, if I remember it was 66 trucks an hour, which would be more than a truck a minute, you would have a constant line of trucks with no, no uh, space in between uh, because just of the light uh, trying to get through, it would take hours for that time frame 
of trucks to go through that that uh yes sir i i was just out while you were talking i was looking scanning down our list we have a in this list in the backup we numbers of trucks are addressed uh as well, as are going to be addressed let's uh, put it it, it would seem to me that a cup i'm not trying to tell you what to do but a couple oh, let's get in line <laughs> <laughs> Get the line. <laughs> I'd look for a couple of very important points would be the the times of day that a truck could could. Uh, do you have operate. a recommendation when, and hours that are more conducive to what you would like? My, to, my like? thought would be ten to three would be an absolute maximum. Okay, well we'll write that down. <laughs> uh, the other maybe the, wishful thinking, but we'll we'll put it. Down. Well, yeah. we can try, can't we? Yeah. Uh, the other point would be the number of trucks permitted per hour. Right. Uh, that's that's very that's a big target. Those, those item. two items, I think, would help the situation. Uh, and again, and as I mentioned, in addition to Westside Villas, we have Ranch Land across the street, right. which is a uh, an extremely senior citizen uh, outfit, uh <laughs> development, and that would pose a, a great problem for them also in getting in and out of the there yes sir so i i, th I just wonder have these i think things that I, I think that they're they're not addressed specifically yet but they're addressed to be addressed as regulations that's part of this 30 list of 30 items that we intend to regulate either more thoroughly or have regulation or more thorough regulation on. okay that's what i wanted to know don't Thank take you. my word for it though you keep watching <laughs> Okay. Good I see Ms. Fransky. Good to see all of y'all today. <laughs> Appreciate the opportunity to speak. Suzanne Fransky, AU 19037 This isn't about Street. the class action suit, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you a sweetie pie? <laughs> um, good to see the staff. So good to see everyone address, here. Please? And uh, she, she just, lives, just Suzanne, wanted to give bring, her your name and address. She lives off. Oh, I'm sorry. Suzanne Fransky at 8190 37th Street, corner of 82nd and 37th. And um, I appreciate you remembering our conversations about the um, destruction to homes. My house, I, I would invite all of you, please, to come and see it, as well as the road on South 82nd today. Uh, as it relates to the house, I have severe foundation cracks and uh, which only happened when the mining started and I've also had four glasses that walked off my kitchen shelves and broke because the house shook so hard and um, it's serious you know I'm thinking how do I get that resolved who's going to pay for that you know who allowed that to happen and um, it's very upsetting you know it's my home and there are a lot of other homes out there another home that is contemplating this has the same believes that it happened from that as well. I know mine did because my house was only two and a half years old. Truck started running and when you have glasses falling off your shelves, uh, you know you're in trouble and your wall is shaking. But that's, that's the um, first thing. And secondly, regarding what South Florida does, Martin County and all the other counties, you know, I've got to tell you the truth. I'm not terribly interested in what they have done because I thought Indian River County was unique and special. I thought that that's why we chose to live here instead of in Dade County, Broward County, Martin County, St. Lucie County. I thought that's what Indian River County was about, being unique. Um, I also wanted to address, if I may, the uh, conditions of the road. Uh, indeed, the, the truck traffic is now going northbound on 82nd, which has never really, I mean, those of us that are on southbound, we feel for our neighbors on northbound because we know what it was like on southbound. Southbound, there's at least 350, 400 residents between the ranch land and all the other residents on the east side and then us further up, not counting when you go on up 82nd. But today um, I had a mission to go uh, northbound where it's still, not where the miners are, but where it's dirt road still and they have gravel. The miners have fixed their road, which I must say, I don't, I don't go there too often, but it's much better than it was. However, what we've been left with is a residual of mud and muck. And today, the reason I came in late is because since I was on a mission, I was in my truck, not in my car. If I was in my car, I'd still be waiting for the tow company to come. I got stuck on that road again. I would beg you, 
please go out and look at that road tonight. Take your car down, blow your horn, so we'll get our pickups to come pull you out. Mm -hmm. But I'm not kidding. If the sun's been out all day, it is nothing but a mud sludge road. And I got stuck, had to get out, get aboard, had to go back home, change clothes to come in. And I was dressed to come in. And it's so frustrating because it's not, no one can monitor this or no one has done it effectively. And we've been talking about this for well over two years. And I had a two struts break in my car. I mean, I didn't know a car had struts, but it's very expensive. I mean, that's thousands of dollars. And I'm sure it's from that road, you know? So anyway, I wish, I wish you'd come out, please. This is an open invitation. Please come look at the foundation of my house. It's very clearly cracked, and it's half-inch cracks. You'll see them all the way through. And also, please come and drive the road today. I mean, we can't keep coming back for help over and over. You know, this is not something we created. At the last meeting I was at, you had invited a gentleman from Fisher uh, Company to come and speak. And he discussed that once the base of these roads are destroyed by these trucks, there's really nothing you can do about them. And that's the situation. We've been left with that residual. And I wish you'd come see it. I'd, I'd really appreciate that. Uh, the next thing is, as it relates to risk management, on 69th, if you're that road with the, on the side where the trucks are loaded, going out eastbound, it's a porpoise road now. It's a porpoise road. So when you talked about the impact fees that the truckers have to pay, look at the fees we as county taxpayers are paying to repair these roads, and that's going to be all over the county. We've already paid for one bridge, everybody in this community. Now look at, just drive 69th and look at that. And it's slowed down some. Wait till it ramps up again. And more importantly, you need to really go when the schools are running, because when you see those big dump trucks bearing down on the back of those school buses, I'll tell you what, it sets a focus real clear for you real fast. And I have seen that repeatedly. And that's a visual anybody can go look at. And um, the other thing is, I guess that when we talk about what, what the miners are paying and, um, you know, who's monitoring their traffic, it all comes down to the citizens of Indian River County. We're paying, we've, we've, we've had near-death accidents on that road. That's all recorded. You know, there have been sheriff's de deputies out there when we've had serious accidents. And when it's not raining, the south end of that road, the dust is so, it's not a dust storm. It's like, it's like desert storm. I mean, it's not just a little dust kicking up on you. You can't see where you're going. So we either live with mud and getting stuck or dust and the risk of these accidents and the storms. So that's really all I have to say, except this is, this is so serious. This is the tenor of our county for years to come. And I understand, as does everyone else, about the regulations being made. But this is Ag 1. Ag 1 permits for these uses of residences and farms, and it's a conservation easement on that road. I mean, these folks, everyone there needs protecting. We're the ones that are paying the taxes. The communities that live there, we need help protecting the services we've paid for. And it's not just monetary values, it's life, it's risk, it's death, it's the safety of children and animals, and it is actually the whole complexion of what our county will look like moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Mr. Sexton. I'm Sean Sexton, 7880 37th Street, um, which is just off 82nd Avenue. And um, the, um, the primary issue of compatibility that I um, hold nearest and dearest regarding um, uh, mining in our vicinity is that of groundwater. And um, I think the, uh, the Ag Advisory Committee made a recommendation that a hydrological study of the county be made and that we establish some baseline um, information with which we can uh, determine uh, when, when and if, if and when mining occurs, there has been impact on the vicinities of the mine, the cone of effect, so to speak. And um, I, um, I see it listed in the, in the report, and um, I, I hope that, um, that that's a, a, a recommendation that's taken to heart, not only by your group, but by the, the commission. And um, I would like to also suggest um, 
that we we actually have wells monitoring wells if we have any mines um, contiguous to our to our ranch that we have uh, wells monitoring wells on our place as well and that that be an expense borne by the miner so that we can uh, know whether we're being affected or not and um, if if mining is imminent, I'd like them in there as soon as possible mm -hmm. so that we can uh, have a starting point from which to determine whether we're really having our water table um, jerked out from under us or not. We are in a, in a situation now, uh, we've always been in a situation of trying to succeed at our farming uh, enterprise, but in a certain way we're in a contractual, we're, we're contractually obliged to farm and um, we take that um, obligation or, or that obligement um, to heart and um, it's not a thing we can do without proper water resources. So um, I, I do hope that you pay attention to, um, to that uh, condition of our lives and, uh, and um, help us to uh, do what we're doing in the same way that you might help um, someone else to mine. Thank you. Thank you. Stan, in the monitoring list of our items, we, we, we refer to monitoring. Were we including, you know, we, at one point during our environmental session, we talked about monitoring wells and the time frame and distances on and off property. Did, is, that inclu is that something you were intending in that? Yes, there, there really are two approaches. One is kind of a, a countywide approach to update a, a 1988 study um, that was done countywide. Uh, and that's a recommendation of the Agriculture Advisory Committee to get data, countywide data. And in the in the regulations that are that are being considered at, at this point in time, it would be uh, on a site by site basis. And you know, generally you have monitoring wells around the perimeter of the of the project site. The idea being that if 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 there's any problems, it'll show up there before it'll show up further out fr from the mine. And uh, and to get baseline data right now. County does not have a requirement for, for the baseline data, but St. John's does. However, the monitoring doesn't start until they're already in the water table and in their right. operation. The idea being that you get at least one wet season and one dry season monitoring reading. I mean, the recommendation you start or, or the conversation revolved around monitoring a year prior to yes. mining, so you had a base, better baseline. That's I'm correct. not sure if, if that was something we were really following on or not. But I think what Sean's talking about is saying South Florida is doing this with the Everglades plans and the water retention areas is the monitoring wells are actually going on the adjacent. They're putting pro not, on the, not only on your property line but into an adjacent property if it was so requested, I think. And I didn't know if special exception use would allow that right. or not. We, we haven't, have not yet addressed it. In that particular idea, in other words, if an adjacent property owner would allow it, a monitoring to well right. to go on his or her property. It's part of the that's, place because they're not sure be with, their, with their reservoirs. You know, they're they're monitoring the same thing. So right. I'm that, not sure how to consider. I'm not sure how we do that here, but that's something we probably need to pick, make sure it's in the mix. We will add it to. Well, the when the county was putting in is putting in its wells up there, in North County. I mean, there is a certain amount of monitoring done then, right? Mm -hmm. And you re, that was more or less required at the time. I don't know if we, well, they were monitoring or they just took history from the wells around it. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. You're right. If that was historical data that they happened to have. Uh, in I think that, that part of the I thought the future, in the future, they're supposed to be doing this to find out the effect of those three new wells or the six new wells, I guess, that are going in there. To put it actually establishing monitoring wells. Right. I, mean, I wasn't sure. That's I thought. Was and especially since the, the county now does own the development rights on the Sexton Ranch, I think it would be. We should protect all our development, the properties that we have purchased with uh, our bond money. So that should just be prudent uh, county county action, I would think. Because there's the other, uh, we're talking out on the Ag 3, the, the other ranch that we purchased. We should probably do some monitoring there, too. Thanks. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Sharon Cowan. I live at 2125 82nd Avenue Southwest. Fly in ranches subdivision. Um, I would like to just piggyback what everyone else has said, but also add 
to the fact that what we have in the books now is really old information and lifestyles change and things change and we need to change to keep up with that i get the distinct feeling that staff sometimes considers the people those of us who live in ag one two and three as people who maybe don't matter there's continued reference to it's ok to put the mining operations here because there aren't many people there well we're still there and we're still people and we would like to be respected and in our lifestyles be thought of as just as valuable as someone else's i'm taxed at the same rate that someone who doesn't have to put up with the mining operation is that's really not fair had i known that a mining operation was going to come into my area eight years ago i would never have bought there i didn't have that benefit so when i'm already there and i know i made this comment last year one of these meetings we were there first to have something like this forced on us when we don't really have a choice is really not fair as taxpayers so i would just ask that you consider ag one in particular a residential just like mr knight said we are a residential area and um we need to be thought of as such and when we're especially when we're already there and we don't have a choice in this we have to live with it maybe somebody needs to look at our tax structure thank you for your time yes ma'am um anybody else on the right hand side in the center center section <laughs> center section chuck come on on the left hand side Chuck Kramer, 10729 U.S. Warren Sebastian. Uh, I wasn't going to say anything today, but I just want to address a couple little issues here. Uh, one of which just came up about it. adjacent property well monitoring or well installation. Mm -hmm. That's a tough issue. Been there. Right. Uh, some cases, owners don't mind you access the property to put in adjacent property wells, and in some cases. Some owners all of a sudden discover that they have a wetland area on their property. They get upset, and the way they discover it is through the environmental assessment of your property. So I don't know if you want to make that, you know. I, I'm not sure it's going to be a, with something, but I want it in the mix is all, Chuck. Only yeah, I think under the, special, under the special exception use, it's something that if this we continued it in Ag One, for instance, you could you could if they requested it, it could be required. That's all. Mm -hmm. I just and you know I've had that other agencies impose that and sometimes right. it doesn't work well. Vibration. Uh, I'm not quite sure what I would think would be a real significant vibration from trucks on the highway to adjacent properties as far as the distances involved to those residents. However, I, I think it's minimal at best because if I look at that in the big picture. By now, every house on the FEC railroad will have collapsed. Uh, I don't think I don't think it's that that relevant. I, I don't think, particularly on cases of roads with adjacent canals where the horizontal transmission of the vibration is affected, I don't think those vibrations are that that severe. If if I were to have a structural problem on, on a dwelling or a home, I, I would look at other factors besides the fact that, that the truck traffic out on a stabilized road would cause that impact. And I just want to get that in there because I'm not quite, you know, looking at that as a big factor. I don't, I don't recall ever even having a discussion with the county in the, in the almost 20 years I've been here over vibrations generated by trucks on highways. Pump vibrations, no, didn't know she's on. minimal at best. <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine a pump on a site with including the county setbacks being a vibration issue unless it had an engine on it the size of a locomotive engine. I can't see it being a problem. Uh, when I was 20 years old, 10 years was a long time. When I was 30 years old, it was kind of a long time. I'm 50 years old, it's not a very long time. Mining's still a temporary use, 10 years is still temporary. And I think we have to keep looking at it as a temporary use. Uh, Mr. Moore's figures, I liked what he did very much. However, I think it excluded some other issues, drain fill, sand, yard fill, which you know can be anywhere from 20 to 10 to 20 additional loads. 
Plainfield sand for the eight additional loads. I think you need to add some cost to that figure. And I would be hard pressed in an already depressed industry to add any cost to the price of a home, period. I think when you try to look west of uh, 190 or I-95, as far as to mine west of I-95 as, as, as a solution to your problems, those trucks aren't going to fly back into the county. They're going to drive some of the very same routes to get back into the east side of 95 and into the service area that they're using now to haul material from pits that are located on the east side of 95. So I don't see that as a cure-all. It's not going to be. Uh, now, as far as 82nd Avenue, and I'll make this comment because I believe when Wild Turkeys first talked about submitting their plan, they talked about 200 trips. That's uh, right. That's not out of line with what anybody else has done on 82nd. And the scenario of continuous trucks, one after the other, for the entire day, uh, I don't recall. I mean, I'm in the fill business. And I've never seen trains of trucks. Things happen during the course of a day to break up that traffic. You don't see constant, constant, constant trucks. I don't know the situation on 69th. That may be happening because you have routing taking two pits worth of traffic uh, up those roads. And maybe the solution to that is to not restrict them to a single route. That may be something you want to look at. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't see the train effect happening going south. If wild turkey was to exist with 200 trips a day, you're not going to have the train effect of Route 60. I don't believe it's going to happen. And as far as uh, anything else, I want everybody to remember, a lot of us in the mining industry, we're citizens of the county, too. Taxpayers of the county, citizens of the county. And we're trying to run a business just like many other businesses in the county. And we want to be treated fairly, just like everybody else. And that's it. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Have a nice day. Okay. Yes, sir. Fred Mensing. I, like Mrs. Boyd, am a candidate for County Commission District 1. Uh, have been in the trucking business. My parents were involved as partners in a quarry. On the issue of vibration, the American trucking industry has done everything they can to take the vibration out of the truck. They've gone from hard springs to this to that to air ride so they can haul electronics without breaking it. They know that the surface of the road determines what vibration is transmitted off the road. The smoother the road, this is an issue that has to be weighed out. A little sand mine that may produce a million yards of sand in its life cannot put the money into a road that a five million yard sand mine can put into the road. And the overall impact of the community and how many homes or CBS warehouses or whatever can be built from this mine have to be evaluated into how you address the problem going from a dirt road, which washboards within hours of grading it, to a hard road, a macadam or blacktop, whatever we wish to call it, that, you know, you won't have the vibration factor. Uh, this is something that, you know, I think you need to, you know, look into, uh, realize that, you know, sand miners don't have the deep pockets everybody thinks they have. Taxpayers don't have the deep pockets, but also if this area is going to grow in any way, Sand mines like jails and landfills, we've got to have, you've got to come up with the regulations to make it work out. And, you know, the question came up on vibration, and that was the main thing that, you know, I think you have to realize that if you build a smooth road, it'll stay smooth. The same as I will tell you, if you drive through a mud puddle on a dirt road at one mile an hour, that mud puddle won't get very big. But if everybody drives through it at 30 miles an hour, it'll get real big because the hydraulics are pushing through there. We'll do that. The same happens with a dirt road as washboarding. If everybody goes at a mile an hour, it'll never washboard. But go at 20, it's going to washboard. If it's paved, it's going to stay intact if it's built right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Anybody else? Last, well, I'm surprised. No, no, Susan. I mean, I, I'm, we, 
we don't we understand your house and the vibrations. Believe me, it's duly noted. Well, come up to the come up to the mic, and. Thank you. And I understand that all of us are taxpayers. And I think that certainly in our community and in our state and in our nation that health, safety, and welfare should be preeminent and supersede that of a cash value. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, anybody else? If not, we're going to close public hearing. I did this last time and had to reopen it. Are we sure? Mm -hmm. okay. Steve's not here. Huh? All right. We're done with the public hearing, for the time being anyway. Um, we've got a list of items here and, and a couple of thoughts. I, Stan, I was just thinking out, thinking about a few things that we might have looked at, too. On big property, is there a way to st – we do this 20-year phase-in. I wonder if we could if, – if we're in a, an area, whether it's Ag 1, Ag 2, or Ag 3, where there is the potential for – Residential, because that could be anywhere in those three areas. If we could start the farthest away, the 20 acre, the 20 acre phase would be the farthest away from potential um, residential, rather than you know next door to it. If you if you got 300 acres and you start on the north, and there's a potential house or people on the south, at least over time, you're working their way. You'll be would seem to be to be less damaging than if you want to consider it that damaging. Right. So you're saying to, to, th to throw into the, the mix of regulations, when we look at the phasing when you, regulations. When you look at the layout, the phasing and whatnot, it's maybe start, if, if there's 10 houses on one side and 20 on the other, I don't know if it's fair, but start with those leased housing if there's if that was the case, if you could do that. Um, I don't know how we do the number of mines along a route, but I think that that's something that we've got to consider. I, and I think that that, again, goes back to what is the appropriate tr volume of volume traffic, traffic for right. the type of road, especially, and, and, and looking at, at those impacts. Because really what we're looking at is the haul, the haul truck. Well, I mean, it's in theory, if we said this route will hold 200 trucks a day and the first mine comes in and that's we give the first mine 200 trucks a day, then somebody's got to wait until we get, move on to the next before they come back in. Is that... And, you know, that we haven't been doing that, but that's... Right. Well, you, you have, again, this is, this is dealing with, you know, especially when you're talking about shared haul routes. And, right. And I think, you know, we've talked about what, is there a threshold where, where paving, you know, would make a difference and allow, you know, you'd have a higher allowed volume of truck, truck traffic on a paved road versus, versus unpaved road. Out yep. of curiosity, yep. to follow on what George is saying, have, have you looked at... Um, regulations that we could, you know, specific wording. Because what George was saying is, is you know, how many years, how many residences are along that street, what what number of trucks is is conducive to that area? Right, and the and and again, the the overall. First of all, the parameter that we're dealing with right now is that access from the mine will be directly to a major roadway. 82nd Avenue, Oslo Road, 510, 512. Those are major roadways. And so that's the first, is, that's an appropriate, in staff's opinion, criterion. That has to be a major roadway. Then, so you're dealing with a major roadway and what is um, yeah, an, an acceptable amount of truck traffic when it's in an unpaved condition, when it's in a paved condition. And this, this concept, too, and, and the concern that's been expressed about you know, trains of trucks, a whole, I've, I've heard Chris Moore use the term platoon, you know, a whole grouping of trucks at one time and what that, what that does in an intersection. Um, those are the types of things that we've discussed and that we're, we would be looking for you know, fashioning regulations to address. Uh, Greg? A couple of thoughts. Um, I think next August is going to be a very interesting session because I think we're here for a couple of reasons. One was a scare out of Miami. And second was absolute noncompliance on 82nd Avenue. And uh, Chuck's comments interested me in that I know he's been doing this for a very long time. And I don't want you to have to get back up, Chuck. I don't mean that. But I just wonder if you have seen before the conditions and any of the mining that you've done that have been associated with 82nd Avenue, where there's been such an allowance for uh, homes, people, 
to be affected by an activity such as that. The other thought I had is it's interesting to hear the, the concerns about Ag 1, 2, and 3. And I would have no problem at all seeing those rewritten because I think they have changed a lot since the inception of those uh, zones. But I think it would be extremely important if that were to happen that in the future that the county cause people who are going to go in those areas for whatever uses may be understand the stipulation of that area so that it doesn't become a fluid document in effect and that the inching of new things in each one of those zones occurs and then people say, look, I want this this way now. I think we have a requirement to allow them to know up front what the conditions of use are going to be in the future based on those rewrites so that they can make decisions as to where they want to place themselves or their businesses or whatever it may be. I think that's why the, the survey that the Ag uh, Committee recommended it should be done because then we could get an idea. The, Ag, the, commi the Ag Committee did that. That's what he, if I'm, the Ag Committee went over it and the only change was special exception on mining, right? Yeah, actually, and, and Mr. Sexton is on, on the committee and, and the two recommendations, one was on the baseline data countywide and the other was on you know, going to special exception uh, in, in, in all three of the districts. Yeah, but I'm saying we need to implement that. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. I, I understand it's there, but we, we need to have it done. And Correct. The county, it needs to be brought before the county commission. Is, is, what's the status of that? Well, you're, you're talking about the the overall yeah, when, when yes, when well, the ag advisory committee may that could that could get reported to the board one or two ways. Either the ag advisory committee has a representative present that to the board. We'll certainly when when we report to the board, it'll probably be either at the end of August or beginning of September on this whole rewrite. We will report that as well. Because that would be an important issue on, on your planning ahead, so that people do know. In advance, what's happening? Where where these sites are, and there would be more information. Part of what the impetus when they went through this was was tied to them. It started with they were going to do it anyway, I think, right, John? And then we it got pushed ahead because of the mining issue. So it's kind of and it's going it's moving forward with uh, with the mining recommendations. That's the. I was worried that the people might consider it's too costly to do the study, and and you know I think it's that's, it's going to be a fact. It's going to be a factor at some point. The hydrologic study will be, could be. Uh, the USGS. The, uh, the I think one thing that we maybe among us we ought to discuss that that to me is I think we've got a list of 30 items and we for you all have all looked at them. If you have a question about them, you can bring them up. But I think they have done a fairly good job of going over all of the concerns and listing the pros and cons and it, and are attempting to address some of the issues within the context of rules and regulations within the three districts. I think the only issue that needs to really probably the staff may want guidance on and we all may differ on, and that is the whether or not you have mines in Ag 1 or you don't. I mean, if you go, I don't think there's any question about Ag 2 and 3. I haven't heard a complaint yet. But if you change, because if you change to special exception use, you bring in a whole lot more criteria. The notice area needs to be considered whether it's more the route or half mile. Um, I think that'll come out in, in the regs down the road. But the, you know, the only other question is whether or not we go ahead and maintain mining in Ag One or Two. There's not a whole lot. There's not a whole lot of area left in Ag One for mines, but it's not going to change the, the western edge between what 66 to 95, mm -hmm. and especially on the northern up by 510. There's a huge. There's a big area with the basses. There's along 82nd Avenue. There's still mining area. And then to the south of 60, I think there's probably less, but there's still area. So, you know, you have to probably let them know whether we're going to maintain mines or not. Because that's, I mean, I, th I hear this, don't do it. But on the other hand, I hear people saying we can do it, we can regulate it. And in fairness to Chuck and the Fishers, they're one of the reasons we have been listening to him. And I know that it, there's, it sounds like it's pro mine, not pro mine, but is that the fishers have put mines in the middle of subdivisions in Sebastian and they have little to no complaints. So we have to, you have to trust somebody somewhere on the other side, if you want to call it that, but they've done a heck of a job. So I, he can't, I, 
you have to listen to what he's saying, and it's, it's, it's the mine operator or how they do it. Now, whether it's stacking mines on 82nd that created the problem that we're here for, I don't know. But I, for one, hate to see us do away with the mining in Ag 1 because I think that it's still a, an issue on traveling. But I'm just going to tell you that. But I think we can do a, we can do a lot better job as a county of, ma of main regulating it. Okay. <laughs> Do we want to go, I mean, if, go so through these 30 items? For if you've got questions about any one of them, I don't know. Well, i got some recommendations. Okay. Then we can, we'll can we go through the items quickly. And yeah. Uh, if you've got questions or whatnot, then we can come back. But but I think we need to think about the real thing, the big issue. The big is issue. Ag 1 or not Ag 1. Early on, we talked about no uh, discharge of the dewatering de uh, stand. All the watering is to be re remain on site. Right. I, let me just, as we're kind of going through these, do you all, <laughs> excuse me, you want to go through attachment nine where we have those 30? Yeah. And we can be referring to numbers? Yes. The first one is the surface water discharging or dewatering. Uh, we had talked about uh, main, keeping all the watering on site, no discharge off site. Right, and, and we had discussed that, and there, there was some ambivalence on that at, at the end of, of the other workshop. Uh, really, two, two approaches. One is you, you have an absolute requirement that there be no discharge, and then the other approach is to monitor the discharge. And, of course, there are reasons given why you might want to, to allow you know, discharge to, main, to be maintained off-site. There may be historic flows and so forth, and it would be better to do it that way. So what, what we took away from that was to allow... I mean, somebody could have no discharge on site, off, from off-site right. if they wanted to, or they could go the monitoring route. And so what we've discussed here is if they go the monitoring route, they've got to, to do baseline data for, at the outfall points. Do we want to put a time frame on it, one year, or, or just leave it at two seasons? I don't think it would. I, in, in this particular case, we're talking about surface water, so we're concerned about water quality, not seasonal fluctuations for groundwater. So I don't think we need the, the seasonal... Um, so much as we need, we, and we, we can look into that. But we, we, we talked about just not allowing that. Is there is this is this, a, this is there some part of the mining that is necessary to allow discharge? There there could there could be some some reason there could be some reasons why you uh, want to allow discharge. And well, as, we make that the exception then. Well, I think I, I don't think you do. I mean, I, I think you want to give the option. Of, of no discharge or monitor the discharge. And I think there's going to vary from site to site. There are going to be some reasons why uh, you'd, want, you'd want to allow discharge. And, and it could have some, if you did not allow discharge on some sites, uh, I think you could probably, you might wind up with more lake area than you really want, uh, you know, at the end of the day. And, yeah, but it and, 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 and again, I think as long as you're monitoring that, you're, that, that the discharge, the, the quality of the discharge is not degrading what the historical discharge has been, then, then I think you, you know you've addressed the issue, and that, that's why we've we summarized. But you're right; it was it was a discussion point. There was not agreement at the right. at the at the the first workshop on that. Stan, does no discharge mean inside a 500 year event or a 100 year event? Well, that that's the other issue yet to be fleshed out. If you went with a no discharge rule, yeah, what what do you do during certain storm events? Uh, you've got to design for some storm events. So, yeah, you're right. At some point. Mother Nature is going to going to create a discharge at some at some level. That would be an, if you went to no discharge, you'd have to define that. I, I mean, the reason I ask is I was under the impression, and Chuck, somebody can help me here, is that if you didn't do any discharge, you you say you could create more lake space. It would be also you mean you you, you shrink the size of the mine. Yes. Uh, right. I mean, it could be you had to make a smaller mine. Right. You you might or 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 a larger site. Um, but you might have more site area covered by covered by water, and you may you may not want to force that as as an outcome. That mine we visited on on 82nd Avenue there that was uh, self contained the discharge and seemed to be working quite well for them. Right, I think it might it might on some on on, on some some, some mines yeah. it might you just might not want to constrict that. Okay. If, if again the water quality is not degraded and and they can prove that by baseline data and monitoring data, then that's that's one thing. If they want to go to no no discharge, but but I think under like Mr. Smith was bringing up and under some stormwater design, at, at some point there will be discharge if there's oh, if yeah. there's a huge storm and you, you need to be prepared for that. 
Anybody else got uh, other questions? We have to go back to the other part. Right. Oh, we get the traffic a nuisance. I have another one. I think on traffic again, you know, the uh, traffic volume uh, tying that, and again, the standards for the roadways are um, um, are, are in there as well. What's is there a threshold for uh, upfront paving of a hall route and that sort of thing? I think that's that's already in there. The items that kind of additionally came out of today's uh, input, I think, one was uh, we, we will look for studies on vibration and see if we, we can get some of that information and have Public Works look at that. Uh, the other item that came up a, a couple of times was on the notice requirement. Half mile may make sense, but also uh, along the primary hall route, you know, any parcel that's, that's fronting that, give them notice as well. Yes. One thing I would point out, I think if you, if you do that, and that's, that's certainly a legitimate idea, um, you know, your, your word will get out. And so, you know, if there's somebody that uses that haul route, but they're, you know, a couple of parcels away, if the people along that haul route get here about a chance, good chances are uh, the other Well, I think that what you need to do is balance that with the, the percentage of the trucks coming out. I mean, if, it, if there's one truck that's going to be on your haul route, I'm not sure that the county needs to go to the expense of notify, notifying that whole route, but the, potentially the half mile and or a, a distance down, a reasonable distance down, like down 69th to 66th, right along the edge of the road or something, probably would have made sense. Right. I think that the primary hall route, uh, as, as I'm, I'm using that term, would probably mean where you get to your first, you know, major, ma major, major, major road right. intersection. Right. And, and so right. the primary haul route is going to be, you know, is going to be the roads that's going to get the majority of the traffic right. uh, from the trucks. And that's what you'll use for notice. Right. Are those notices computer generated or flagged the, automatically when you determine the routes? Well, um, what, what we would do for, for any of our notice requirements, you know, we, we have a, a computer system that and basically it goes off the tax roll, whoever's okay. on the latest a tax roll. One thing that, that is kind of an advantage to going to special exception, there are two public hearings there. So if there are any notice issues that come out, we get a, we get a uh, you know, return mail you know, and that sort of thing. That issue may happen at the P&Z level, and, and there will be time to straighten that out or, or try to get a more up-to-date address for the, for the second hearing. kind of gives you two, two chances of that. On the uh, traffic, uh, I don't, we talked about Jake breaks. Um, we don't mention it here in w one of these items. There, there was restricting it, not, not maybe forbidding it, but restricting it anyway. That, that's correct. I think the only place that you could, and, and this was a lot of discussion from, from Chris Mora, I think the only place that you could restrict Jake breaks, in his opinion, was on site. That, w that when you get off site, you know, if, if a vehicle has a braking system, um, that, you know, to, to tell them that they can't use it could be a, a traffic safety issue. And, and he did not support that. So I think if there were to There's be any, any regulations about Jake Brakes at all, it would be probably use on site. On site. And I think that's public, that's, that's public works. Well, isn't there a sign now on 69th Street when they make that turn, forbid Jake Brakes? There, and operators can do that themselves. No, I mean, they, sure. they may, you know, be able to instruct it. But again, public works staff was not comfortable telling someone they couldn't use a braking system on the on the public road. Well, liability. Yeah. And the other thing is, uh, again, this would be enforcement. Would be better covers on these trucks. A lot of these covers are pretty well torn up and uh, beat up. And there has been some uh, industries where they spray the load with the uh, binding materials, especially in the coal mining industry. The railroad cars, uh, as they leave a coal mine, they sprayed the top with a, some type of binding material to prevent the dust from coming off these trucks as they're going down the road. Now, do we look into anything like that? Well, that's part of the uh, one of the suggested requirements is a is kind of a, a control plan for for spillage, and okay. and there are a couple of different methods that you can use, and, and this kind of gets back to the best management practices. There may be more than one technique, right. and they can choose one. Mm -hmm. uh, if you know if it's not working, they've got to go to another one. That would kind of be the idea of the best management practices for something like that. But then again, it's enforcement too, uh, right? Well, that's the, the key to all right. this. Is, is at some point. If, if, if you've got all these options, what do you do when? And that's that's what this is. The only other comments I'd have was maybe 
limiting the, the size of the load to 15 yards as maximum instead of a, uh, 17 or something. And then the, uh, clarify the existing 20 acre phase in to maybe just 10 acres where it would be less impact instead of saying 20 acres at a time. We do t 10 acres at a time would be a lot less impact both uh, environmentally and uh, mm. hydrologically and everything else. Uh, I'm sure they could, mining 10 acres at a time is still a pretty good sized mine instead of the 20 acre requirement we have now. I, you know, I, that's all I have. I don't know. I don't know if it's uh, economically feasible or too much of a burden. Just kind of the only context I can provide is kind of like our, our tenure rule, the 20 acre phase yeah. uh, I've not found in any other regulations of, of any other county. I think it's pretty restrictive as far as I can tell uh, in, in terms of context and how much, you know, kind of looking at how much exposed area that you have. Um, economically, you know, it, it seems to work in this area. I don't know if less works or not. And, um, you know, at some point there's, you know, there's a dividing line there. And I'm not sure where that is. That's all I have. We can, we, I mean, we need, may need to talk to some people about, I guess. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Okay. Anybody else got any things? Through here. One absolutely last question, if there is one. No, I to, go ahead. Your wisdom is always worthy of comment. I just want to know where, if the commission imported those three lights from Panman John. I don't know. I feel like we're, we're at this a hot seat, but it's like kind of like the, you know, I don't know. Our halos maybe ought to be affecting it. The <laughs> they don't want us to look up. That's all. I, I really do think, and I don't want to. I don't want to beat the horse to beat the beat a horse with this, but I'm telling you the one th the issue is that that that's the, the biggest consideration in the end of this is whether or not you mine in Ag One or not. And I, I and, and I said I don't particularly want to lose it, but I mean there's not a big area. I know Chuck and them it's, it affects the distances of halls, but that's the one thing I think probably if you want the the final word, all these regulations are great, but I think each one of us need to be thinking about yes or no on that one issue. Okay. Anything else? Stan, you got any other questions or you want any other guidance? I mean, I think you all have done a remarkable job considering, you know, we, we, we go off on tangents. We've, we've talked about trying to drown ourselves or, or dry ourselves out with water and the run over with trucks and, and, um, but I think we've got a, a, a terrific list of items where we've really brought a lot of points to bear. I believe we've got a lot of regulation that addresses what's already here. But I think by the time we get through, we probably will be better off. You know, we'll see when we see your next list. And I and I do believe spe changing from administrative permit to special exception is is in itself a step opens the, right the door, a step in the right direction because we have a whole lot more say so then at, on, e on any given mine. So, thank you all for all your work. Thank everybody for coming. Lawyer's <laughs> Bureau.